Hallo, hallo, buonasera, herzlich willkommen zu unserem vierten deutsch-italienischen Webinar. Welcome to our fourth uh, German-Italian webinar. Today we're going to talk uh, about uh, zero tolerance vis-à-vis uh, -vis money laundering and uh, fiscal or tax dumping. We have an exceptional webinar ahead of us uh, with the participation of uh, the EU Commissioner Mr. Gentiloni, Mr. Tito Boeri. And uh, as usual, we organize things together. Uh, I am uh, together with Alexandra Geze, Sven, uh, Sven Giegold. You will find the translation when you go to interpret on your screen. Oh, no. Korean tonight, but there's no Italian. So Italian is Korean. If you look for Italian, go for Korean. It's not our fault, it's Zoom. Um, you can ask uh, questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, you can put there uh, your points, we will take them up. So English for you. Um, Deutsch is natürlich auf Deutsch. Und jetzt erklärt es gleich noch auf Italienisch Alexandra Giese. Good evening on my side as well. We would like to welcome you to our event tonight. I just wanted to give you some uh, technical indications and then uh, I'll leave the floor again uh, to Francisca who's going to chair the evening. Uh, simultaneous interpretation. If you're looking for Italian, you can uh, either uh, look uh, on the right hand side, uh, interpretation and or translation depending on the type of uh, PC you're using. Opening that menu, you find the languages, you find uh, English, German and Korean. Zoom unfortunately doesn't have Italian, so we use uh, Korean instead. It's not our fault, we apologize. If you use a tablet, uh, the same holds true. You find it uh, on the right hand side on the top uh, with three dots there. You find the menu, interpretation and or translation. You click on that menu, on that item of the menu and you find Korean that will provide you a uh, translation into Italian. Then uh, you can uh, participate uh, actively to the webinar by asking questions. Uh, if you want uh, to uh, ask a question, you must uh, click on the little hand and uh, you will be called upon to ask your question. We'll give you uh, the chance to directly ask a question or you can ask questions via the chat. You can uh, click uh, on, the, on the bottom on Q&A and you can write your question there. It's very important uh, to use uh, that Button just uh, for questions. If you have comments uh, about the audio, please just use the chat. Do take into account that this webinar is going to be recorded, so if you want to ask a question orally, obviously your voice will be recorded and your name will be recorded as well. So do take that into account, please. And then uh, one last uh, thing. Uh, today we're going to launch our new appeal. So please, uh, if you have not uh, signed it yet, please do. And now we'll tell you everything that we need to know, but you'll find uh, uh, the link uh, and you can sign it. And one very, very last thing. If you hear something interesting, something inspiring, and you're on Twitter, Facebook, on social media, on Instagram, whatever, please uh, send posts, uh, tell, people what's happening here. Uh, include the link, uh, include the appeal and tell everybody what is happening here during this webinar. And with this, uh, enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for having provided us all the information in Italian. Today we're going to talk uh, in German, in Italian, and uh, we also have simultaneous translation into English as well. So uh, don't be surprised. You'll also find an English channel. None of us will speak uh, English, but we also wanted uh, those who do not speak either German and or Italian could listen in English. Once again, I'd like to welcome you uh, all uh, on my behalf today. We're going to talk about the appeal that followed uh, our first appeal we launched uh, a while ago. We are now tackling uh, the issue of uh, tax fraud, of uh, fiscal dumping and uh, of money laundering. And it is very important uh, 
you know that sooner or later we'll have to repay our debts. Uh, so it'll obviously be important uh, to have margins uh, for uh, the uh, public bodies at European level and within each individual country. And we want to actually share this burden in a very sort of uh, uh, balanced manner. And that's why, you know, during our first webinar, we had already uh, developed uh, an idea. During our first webinar, in fact, uh, we developed this idea on the basis uh, of the debate we've had. Uh, we then, uh, then uh, giggled and Tito Boeri uh, developed uh, this other appeal which uh, has already been signed uh, by 60 Italian uh, and German uh, VIPs. And we would be very glad if you could sign it as well and if you could actually share it uh, via social media uh, through all uh, the channels uh, you want uh, so that we can actually exercise pressure at, uh, at European level. You will find uh, the link uh, to this appeal in the chat. And uh, today we're going to talk about this appeal, which deals with five main uh, topics. Uh, tonight uh, we can uh, publicly discuss uh, the appeal with the Commissioner, uh, EU Commissioner, Mr. Paolo Gentiloni. Thanks for being with us uh, today. He has about an hour to spend with us because we know that you know he's uh, very busy. Uh, and uh, he's going to have uh, a call uh, at six, uh, so we can uh, have him uh, for about an hour. Uh, this appeal, first uh, and foremost, uh, envisages a description of the main uh, points uh, of, uh, of the appeal itself. And then uh, we'll leave the floor to our guests, and then we'll also leave the floor to you all, uh, because you can ask questions directly or write questions in the Q&A. By clicking on the little hand, you can ask questions uh, directly by raising your hand somehow. So those who will uh, uh, have a chance to ask questions uh, will have uh, to obviously switch the mic on. The webinar is going to be recorded, as we said before already. And uh, as a consequence, if you do not want uh, to see yourself or hear your voice uh, in, the in, uh, in the recording, um, please uh, let us know. We have a few problems with our chat, but we're going to solve it. So I'm really glad tonight of having the possibility of speaking with you. My name is Franziska Brandtner, a Bundestag deputy and responsible for the EU policies. And now we move to the appeal. This I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Tito Boeri, who's very well known in Italy. He's an economist, a professor. He has written his PhD of economics in the US, uh, and uh, he's also uh, edited uh, the Economy and Transition uh, Division. His senior economist uh, at OECD is a professor at the Bocconi University. Uh, in 2014, from 2014 to 2016, he was the president uh, of INPS and also a consultant uh, for the World Bank uh, for the Italian government. So he has a huge uh, economic no uh, knowledge uh, and uh, he also has a website uh, and he has published various publications and uh, he always tries to translate the economic language so that everybody can actually understand it uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to leave him the floor he's the first panelist of this webinar and he can actually introduce the appeal then we'll leave the floor to Sven Gigold and then Paolo Gentiloni. Mr. Tito Boeri to you the floor. Thank you very much uh, uh, we um, have uh, I'd like to, to, to thank you, uh, Commissioner Mr. Gentiloni for his availability to have an open dialogue on these topics. And I'd like to thank you all. Thank you all for the support uh, and for your participation tonight, but also for the support uh, you're giving to this appeal because we have already uh, more than 2,000 uh, signatures, uh, highly qualified signatures. Already. Just a couple of words to try and uh, frame this appeal and explain you why we have uh, started with we do not know what recovery will be like. Uh, there's been a deep crisis, uh, there still is a deep crisis from the economic viewpoint, and we know I mean, there are people who say that it'll be a V-shaped uh, uh, recovery, uh, others instead uh, talk about uh, a swoosh-type 
uh, of uh, recovery, a very long recovery that will prolong in time. But we know one thing for certain, i.e. that we will leave this crisis, unfortunately, with a higher level of uh, inequality uh, than uh, we had before. First, uh, because pandemics uh, actually struck uh, uh, the poor, those who were mostly exposed to the virus, and also because the economic crisis connected to this pandemic uh, has uh, struck uh, the most uh, people who already had low salaries and low wages. Uh, we see this very clearly. Those who kept uh, working uh, with agile working and smart working and remote working are mainly people who already before had higher salaries and sa higher wages. Uh, those uh, uh, people who had lower salaries didn't have this possibility. I mean, if their total income, say 20, the 20%, the poorest people in the, uh, in the population participated only with 10% of smart working, whilst the 20% with higher salaries uh, participated to smart working in 40% of cases. So it's a crisis that had an, a very asymmetric type of impact. Uh, and then it also struck uh, small businesses, much more so than previous recessions. Not only this, uh, it's a crisis that has an impact on the labor market. The previous crisis, uh, you know, would uh, take uh, a while before, you know, leading to unemployment. Uh, this instead was very strong on unemployment. And this uh, on top of uh, a decline in the level of income coming from labor, whilst uh, the level of income coming from capital increases. And this uh, uh, quota is increasing, is increasing thanks uh, to what large enterprises, large multinationals are doing. Uh, we're talking about superstar companies that are taking up uh, uh, the higher share of capital income. Well, Europe decided to react uh, to this very deep crisis uh, uh, through solidarity and by activating uh, tools that have never been activated in uh, before. Uh, and I mean, it's totally new. There is a very important innovation that's taking place uh, at European level with the recovery fund. Uh, the European Commission becomes uh, the first uh, supranational issuer of treasury bonds uh, and uh, with this uh, it will finance uh, recovery programs uh, in the countries that have been uh, most uh, by this crisis. But this effort to become uh, long-lasting, it is a fundamental importance for the European Commission to have uh, uh, tax uh, capabilities. It cannot fund in the long term this activity, these expenses uh, that will take place uh, with uh, contributions coming from individual states. It is very important uh, to work uh, to spread uh, uh, the level of income at a European level. And in this man manner, we can also act uh, on redistribution mechanisms. Uh, in doing so, the European Commission will allow each individual member state uh, to carry out its redistribution policies to tackle problems uh, of inequalities in each individual country, because otherwise it becomes really difficult for uh, one country to tackle uh, this emergency from the social viewpoint. I mean, if you don't have the EU supporting uh, the countries uh, in uh, moving capital income and in lightening up uh, the taxation that uh, exists today. We have developed uh, basically five uh, proposals, and then Sven uh, will go into detail about them. The first one has to do with the idea of introducing a minimum tax rate, uh, a minimum effective tax rate on corporate income. There is a, a, a multilateral initiative uh, with the OECD involved in this uh, uh, direction, and uh, we think uh, this is uh, needed uh, and quickly because uh, we will have to take up uh, a European type of initiative. Then the second very important aspect, the second very important point of our proposal has to do with the web tax, the need to have a common approach to digital taxation, which can hit uh, the giants of the web, uh, where you have consumers uh, and not where the legal headquarters of these companies uh, lie. The third aspect is that of providing a European answer to the dividend arbitrage because this also reduces uh, the tax uh, burden. The fourth aspect is that we are also reducing uh, uh, taxation on people uh, and uh, so we need uh, to defend uh, um, you know, personal income taxation because redistribution doesn't just take place with transfers but also with taxation and different tax brackets. And last but not least, uh, we also uh, think it is necessary to have a European initiative in uh, fighting money laundering. 
And so in this way, it is of fundamental importance to have a strong initiative to relaunch at European level the different uh, activities uh, of uh, police, uh, tax police uh, uh, at European level to try and counteract uh, these uh, fiscal frauds uh, and money laundering in general. So we think these five items are going to be extremely important, and I guess Sven is going to go into detail about them now. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Boeri. Uh, the next uh, panelist is going to be Sven Giegold, he is a finance expert and he coordinates the econ. Thank you to Tito. Tito has highlighted the five items of this appeal. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Commissioner for participating. We uh, really would like to thank him for his participation. We very much appreciate what he's doing. And the content of the appeal has to do with the action plan that will be presented uh, next uh, July as far as taxes go with the different measures that will follow. And we think uh, that there is... Uh, a set of measures the Commission should adopt. As for the capital income, that a proposal has already been presented by the Commission, but the work has been suspended because we're waiting for the ECD. If the OECD will not come to an agreement by the end of the year for the minimum tax, income, income, capital income tax, then Europe will have to act separately. So we should not allow for further postponement. So at this point, uh, we should say, if there's no agreement uh, within the OECD by the end of the year, we will need a European proposal to actually define uh, the uh, minimum effective tax rate on corporate income. And we'll have to work uh, together with a consolidated common uh, uh, general corporate income. We should have to adopt a decision as for tax transparency of companies so that each individual company, especially if it receives state aid, uh, must publish in which country it paid its taxes and has obtained funds or has obtained income and or profits. And this is particularly true for larger digital uh, multinationals, which actually got huge advantages out of this crisis compared to uh, traditional business models. And so Europe must insist uh, so that each individual enterprise uh, publishes how much taxes it paid in which country in Europe. We can no longer afford that those proposals that have already been presented by the old uh, commission keep on being uh, uh, suspended. Then the third item has to do with uh, uh, fighting uh, tax fraud. Uh, we know that we lose about 50 billion euro a year uh, and uh, we've been worrying about this for decades because obviously the member states uh, uh, are incapable of finding an agreement to try and solve this huge issue and uh, we have noticed uh, the same situation holds true when it comes to dividend arbitrage. Uh, and uh, dividend arbitrage is the biggest tax fraud existing. Uh, and here too, we didn't come uh, uh, to any uh, specific agreement. Uh, a proposal has been launched by the Commission, uh, a very strong proposal. But anyway, both uh, tax fraud and dividend arbitrage, we need to act faster and come to a decision when it comes uh, to uh, to tax fraud, especially for capital income, and also for dividend arbitrage, as I said. The fourth item of our appeal has to do with tax competition in Europe, uh, um, which already uh, led to lots of damages, as Mr. Tito Boveri said at the beginning. And we are noticing uh, that the pressure being exercised uh, uh, and that tends to lower uh, the rate, uh, uh, starts involving also personal income taxation. We have countries in Europe which uh, give citizenship to people who pay for the citizenship itself, or uh, people who actually uh, can uh, get very low tax rates. Uh, as a consequence, uh, we notice that each 
the individual member states uh, impose, uh, say, lump sum payments. Uh, also, Italy is doing this uh, with uh, the lump sum regime uh, when uh, the income doesn't go above a certain threshold given certain conditions. Well, the same can be seen uh, in other uh, member states. Uh, so the capital income uh, which is obtained uh, abroad uh, in the country when then uh, uh, the company resides uh, um, doesn't see any payment in taxes. And this is obviously tax fraud. Uh, and this is an extremely important point. I mean, we should try and uh, uh, avoid this uh, from happening. We should not allow um, to... Uh, have uh, what is happening with capital income to extend also to personal income taxation. And then the fifth point uh, has to do with the possibility of trying to avoid uh, abuses uh, uh, and money laundering. The Commission has uh, already uh, launched uh, very interesting proposals uh, or has announced uh, such proposals uh, when it comes to money laundering. Italy, for instance, has made important step for, steps forward. And I'd be really glad if uh, Italy uh, were uh, as severe with, money, uh, with uh, tax fraud as it is with money laundering. But anyway, we need a European... Uh, uh, strength uh, because we don't have a European financial police uh, to contrast uh, financial uh, crime. Europol has activated uh, uh, headquarters last uh, week uh, but with very limited resources so we must try and make further steps forward uh, to try and fight uh, financial crime throughout Europe. And if uh, we will succeed, uh, and if we will be able to put together the best skills of Italy and Germany together, we will solve these problems also at a European level. So I'm really glad about this debate. Thank you very much, Sven, for the presentation of the five items of this appeal. And now we give the floor to Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni. We're very glad to have you here with us tonight. Uh, many of us, uh, are familiar with you in your capacity as an Italian minister and EU commissioner. You've been active since quite some years. You started as a student in your political career, and then you continued uh, getting interested in environmental issues, and maybe we in Germany are not aware of this, but he's also a co-founder and uh, Minister for Communication under the Prodi government, and uh, uh, it was a minister as well uh, with different functions. Yeah. And now we give him the floor. Uh, hello. Uh, okay. I shall continue in Italian. First of all, thank you very much indeed. Um, your event is very much interesting uh, because of the content and because of the number and the quality of the uh, people who have signed it and also because it's an Italian-German initiative and this per se is already a very, very interesting and useful um, message to pass along. Um, this is a unique situation, absolutely unprecedented. We run the risk that uh, the economics and social consequences of this particular crisis are going to be very, very severe. As Mr. Boeri was pointing out, crisis uh, sometime have uh, the uh, goal of reducing uh, social inequalities, uh, but this is not the case with this particular crisis, at least it doesn't sound to be so. And in my capacity as a European commissioner, I am being confronted with a danger more, that is the crisis uh, uh, actually deepens the differences within the EU and uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, threatens uh, some of the pillars in terms of our single market and in terms of convergence among the European countries. A few days back, I used this phrase. I said, uh, after the Great Recession 10 years ago, we run the risk of uh, being very much fragmented within the framework of the EU right now. And this would be very dangerous indeed. 
Now, when it comes to Europe, though, we have to say that uh, in a very short period, and we're talking about some 80, 85 days since the first few decisions halfway through March uh, were taken, other decisions uh, which are truly unprecedented also in this case were being taken. And if we look at the crisis 10 years ago, we cannot say that this time uh, the uh, European Union institutions, uh, the Commission, the Parliament, uh, the European Central Bank uh, have uh, reacted too little or too late. They tried to react uh, very strongly and very quickly indeed. And uh, this also allowed member states uh, through their decisions and the Stability Pact uh, and uh, govern incentives to governments to really deploy all their resources to try to uh, spare companies and subsidize companies and prevent uh, uh, bankruptcies. But we know, for instance, that uh, in uh, all member states we have different situations and different strengths. This uh, ability of uh, uh, trying to do something uh, within the member states uh, have, has to be compensated with pan-European initiatives because if we leave it up only to the reaction of the European member states, this paradoxically will uh, worsen uh, and therefore um, the reaction by the member states uh, are rather positive, uh, but we also need a reaction at the EU level. Uh, in the first uh, phase, we had a reaction concerning rules and regulations, uh, and in the second phase, we have put, uh, available 400 to 500 billion euros of incentives. And in the third phase, uh, we have the recovery plan, uh, which is the Europe of the next generation. This last uh, initiative from the quality standpoint is, in my opinion, together with uh, uh, the uh, action called Su Sure, um, uh, because from the quality standpoint, this particular initiative is very interesting indeed. Uh, but certainly, this plan uh, is really a turning point. Uh, which is very disruptive in terms of breaking a few taboos within the framework of our uh, Europe. I don't know whether uh, we uh, may define it as a Hamiltonian moment and whether this is fair enough to say um, maybe these definitions uh, are better to be ruled out uh, in a few years from now. I don't believe that Mr. Hamilton was aware of the consequences of what it did in the past. Let's say that this has been a very important decision and from many different standpoints uh, an unprecedented one. Now, we have to uh, go to the end of it, we are supported by a very vast parliamentary majority, definitely uh, bigger than the numbers uh, that uh, elected the European Commission. And uh, we have a very positive situation within the Commission as well. We have convergence towards these goals, but we know that getting to the final approval of this plan is absolutely indispensable and we have to work on that. Now, within this particular unprecedented situation, uh, I would like to remind you all uh, that when I started this adventure in November, um, I mean, these adventures uh, are being always uh, um, beginning with the hearing at the European Parliament, and in preparing this hearing, uh, I remember perfectly well that Mr. Sven Diggold um, 
uh, indeed urged me and asked me to take into consideration how important uh, the issue of taxes was going to be in the next five years to come. I don't know whether he has entrusted with specific uh, you know, uh, skills in terms of fortune telling, uh, but this went very much beyond what uh, Mr. Sven Giggled uh, pinpointed at that time, because as Mr. Tito Boeri pointed out as well, the uh, fact of having decided for this next generation fund, uh, well, uh, gives uh, the uh, theme of own resources by the uh, European Union and therefore to taxation as well, an unprecedented importance. But where we shouldn't really continue on the uh, failing um, statement that uh, uh, all this is due to the fact that it's important for us to repay what the uh, Commission will get from the financial markets and we need to gather assets to repay all this tomorrow. We know that uh, loans uh, and uh, the funds that the Commission is going to gather on the financial markets are going to be repaid between 2028 and 2058, therefore a very uh, long term. And we know that financial charges for this particular uh, uh, debt and loan uh, taken into consideration the present cost of money is rather limited. But the point also has to do with the very conception, the very architecture of the European Union. And this has to do with the fact that at the very time when one decides that the Commission starts actually having a uh, fiscal policy as well as a financial policy, which is not just made by thresholds and rules and regulations, but they have have also their own economic resources as well as an economic focus, well then, right then, you are being confronted with the issue that the European accounts and budget cannot just be supported uh, by or only supported uh, or almost only supported by the contribution of the member states. One has to increase one's own resources and this, after all, is basic to the ability that the Commission has to go on financial markets and gather that money which is needed for the next generation E plan. Now, at the very beginning of this uh, um, uh, hearing of mine, I highlighted the importance on uh, taxation. This uh, uh, issue of taxation is even more important now because of this unprecedented situation and therefore taxation is really at the core of the question. And to conclude, uh, only uh, three comments on the three uh, set of issues uh, which we're all confronted with and we are going to be dealing with also through this action plan on taxation, which I'm going to file with the Commission in July. I have to say that there are three families of issues. The first one, and rightly enough, this appeal is geared on this, uh, is the issue which is basic to the institutional European architecture. And this goal can be reached uh, more easily, that is, uh, the fight against uh, fiscal fraud and uh, against uh, money laundering, uh, enhancement of administrative cooperation amongst the various tax authorities and also the review and improvement and enhancement of the code of conduct on tax rules and regulations. This is a set of issues which are within our scope of action and do not require any, at least not all of them, do not require uh, amendments uh, to be decided unanimously. You know that when it comes to tax and taxation, um, they require unanimous decisions or some regulatory um, measures 
But in order to abolish unanimity, uh, these decisions have to be taken unanimously. So uh, this uh, is like catch-22, you know. And uh, or the use of an instrument which has never been used and we are studying, which is Article uh, 116 of the treaties which allows for a majority and non-unanimity in the cases of a severe distortion of the market, and we're working on it. But the first set, that is administrative measures, a fraud, code of conduct, will be a very important part of this action plan. The second set is made by all the um, taxes connected to environmental transition. Um, where we have indeed uh, two uh, major avenues to follow. The first is the review of the directive on the energy taxation, uh, which is uh, an old uh, directive and it dates back to some 18 years ago. And the second one is what we call more formally uh, the carbon border adjustment uh, um, that is uh, the uh, carbon tax, uh, and which is going to be very important to be uh, brought forward within all the difficulties that we are going to be confronted with. I believe that this decision should be indeed connected to the uh, legislation, to the environmental legislation in particular, which is going to be brought forward by the Commission as a fundamental uh, legislation tool uh, uh, for the European Green Deal. The third and last set of uh, issues is the uh, two taxations that uh, are part of the uh, OECD G20 negotiation. The first and second pillar, the first pillar being digital taxation, and the second pillar being uh, the uh, minimum tax level for co at corporate level. Um, I believe that it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to keep up with our commitment to reach an agreement on both these uh, issues by the end of this year. There are a few difficulties when it comes to the first pillar, that is uh, the digital one, because as you know, the US have filed their own proposal, which is completely different from the prevalent one within the framework of the OECD countries, and therefore we are actually discussing between a common uh, proposal and the US proposal called safe harbor by the Americans. And the second pillar, the one on minimum taxation level, um, there are definitely big um, issues with large countries uh, such as China and India. I confirm here what has been said also in um, uh, the letter written by the uh, chairman of the commission, Mrs. Von der Leyen, that is, if we do not reach global uh, agreement on these two pillars, uh, la next year we are going to be discussing our own proposals. Uh, so the agenda is very, very rich and, and we're very, very busy. And uh, the um, re reaction uh, with the recovery fund makes uh, even more so, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, uh, discussable. Thank you very much, Mr. Gentilone, for having given us this general framework. And now I have a, a whole set of questions to ask you, and I believe uh, uh, this uh, to the first comment made, uh, fiscal fraud, uh, fiscal dumping or tax dumping sometimes uh, creates a disadvantage to SMEs, obviously, that cannot, uh, uh, you know, exploit uh, tools that large enterprises use. Uh, you also talked about the possibility of uh, uh, in fact, the next generation fund, uh, which should start in 2028, so we still have a bit of time. But obviously, we also need to uh, consider margins uh, we have uh, at national level within our budget. And despite this, uh, we also received uh, another question. Why is it that we postpone uh, the uh, repayment of such funds for so long? And then another question. 
tax uh, on uh, financial transactions. Uh, we've discussed this for a longer period of time. What's the current status uh, as uh, to this uh, specific proposal? And then uh, I think uh, you've already given a partial answer, but maybe you can go back to this. Uh, we have uh, a question about the minimum taxation uh, for uh, capital income. The question has to do with uh, uh, the own uh, resources uh, you were talking about uh, before. So the question is, uh, what uh, uh, direction are you going to take? Uh, because uh, we uh, talked about next year, if the OECD doesn't come, uh, I mean, if we can't get to, to a decision with the OECD, Europe will start on its own next year. So can you tell us a bit more about this? Uh, what is going to happen for minimum taxation within Europe? What are the possibilities for further developments? Uh, uh, two uh, questions, uh, uh, and then one other question from uh, Lisa Kaus from the Bundestag. Uh, the possibility for Italy to uh, actually record companies centrally that tends uh, to cut uh, uh, tax uh, evasion. Could this be used uh, as a model for the whole of the European Union? And I mean, these are the initial questions, but I guess uh, many others uh, will uh, come uh, at a later stage. Sure. Thank you very much. I'll try and answer them all uh, very briefly. These uh, loans, uh, these subsidized uh, loans, uh, will mature in the long term. When we talk about repayment uh, between 2028 and 2058, uh, well, that means that the countries, sorry, that the, the loans the European Union will provide to the member states uh, that will need such loans, in this case, uh, not all countries uh, have the same uh, requirements, uh, have the same needs. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a possibility which is going to be particularly interesting for those countries uh, which uh, have high interest rates. Uh, because obviously there are some countries such as, for instance, Germany and others as well, which can collect resources on the market at the same conditions or even at better conditions that those the European Commission can reach. But, it, you know, the European Commission still is a, a triple A rating institution and so it can provide loans at very advantageous rates with a very, very long maturity. We even discussed as you will probably remember, about uh, uh, a proposal that also came from uh, one of Sven Giegel's colleagues, the, uh, and which was then followed by the Spanish government uh, of the so-called perpetuals, uh, i.e. perpetual loans without, uh, you know, any repayment, refund. But this proposal did not uh, find great support uh, amongst uh, experts, amongst economists, uh, so it was discarded. Uh, clearly, having a very long-term maturity loans uh, helps uh, member states uh, in uh, uh, actually being capable of uh, receiving uh, this uh, money uh, without uh, great problems. We shouldn't give the idea that you're going to have uh, a huge debt uh, for the next uh, commission and all the budgets of the next few years, because if we work sufficiently well with our own resources, we can certainly guarantee the repayment of the debt uh, given the maturity. 
As for the tax on financial transactions, uh, as you know, unfortunately, this is a topic uh, we've been discussing for the last 10 years here in Brussels. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the European Commission uh, didn't come uh, to any final decision uh, for the whole of the EU. We still have a group of 10 countries working on this. Uh, within uh, the framework uh, of strengthened cooperation uh, as foreseen by European treaties. And this uh, group uh, is working, as I said, uh, and is discussing on whether the type of um, financial transaction tax that will come out of this, uh, of this work, of this uh, limited uh, group of countries, is going to be the best possible hypothesis or not. But still, I think it's going to be a step forward. And so I really hope that in the next uh, few months, uh, it will be possible to come to a conclusion uh, amongst these 10 countries for this strength and cooperation. I know that the finance minister in Germany uh, is uh, very active on this. Uh, I will try myself. Obviously, the Commission here is not the protagonist, but rather the facilitator for these types of uh, strengthen uh, transactions. So we hope we can get uh, to an initial result and then extend it uh, both in terms of its scope uh, and in terms of the number of member states participating to it. But the first step is going to be important. So then third point, uh, I am convinced that if we talk about volumes, I mean, if we talk about resources, about money, and if we talk about uh, the possibility of avoiding fragmentation risks, the fact of having a minimum taxation level, a minimum tax rate for companies that can stop competition amongst the different uh, countries within the EU, then uh, we will certainly have a very promising situation. Not because I tend to underestimate the digital tax and or any other type of taxation that might be introduced in other uh, industries. But in terms of potential uh, results, in, in terms of potential collection of resources and in terms of, uh, you know, limiting unacceptable risks uh, uh, for the different uh, member states, that of minimum tax rate for businesses is possibly uh, the number one priority. You know that uh, the proposal, uh, the CCTB proposal made uh, by the Commission in 2017, 2018, I can't remember exactly, did not reach uh, the necessary consensus level. But you also know that when that proposal, the CCTB proposal was not accepted, the member states uh, that didn't want to accept it explained their position with the target uh, of uh, finding an international, a global solution. The message uh, was not totally negative. They didn't just uh, say no, but rather they said, let's try together with the Commission to go international. Rather than working at a European level, let's try and see whether we can move towards a global type of action. You know that in the US, there is a minimum tax rate model for businesses. Uh, and uh, the idea was, let's try and do something similar that's going to be valid worldwide. Why not? Obviously, avoiding double taxation would be very useful both for businesses and for digital companies. So global solutions in absolute terms are always the best. I mean, they're the best for businesses, and they're also the best uh, for the whole of the international multilateral system. But those who two, three years ago stated, uh, we do not want to accept this uh, European proposal, but rather let's try and find a global solution, because without any global solution, we will go back uh, to considering uh, and discussing the European uh, proposal now next year we'll have to provide an answer 
because now we are going back to the European proposal. So I confirm once again that we are totally committed to this with the work uh, of the technical group uh, in view of an next uh, meeting in Berlin to try and find a solution on these two pillars within uh, the discussion of the OECD. But I confirm as well that if this solution, which is difficult, it's going to be very difficult to reach a, a, you know, a decision on this, uh, given that we're going to have elections in November in the US. I mean, there are political situations that obviously come into play, but if this solution will not come not even for the next uh, G20 Italian presidency for next year. Well, at that point, next year, in 2021, the European Commission will have to come with its own proposal. And last but not least, uh, we can also extend the Italian proposal at European level. Well, we'll, we'll think about it. Well, thank you very much indeed. I have two, uh, I have two, um, short questions and i know that and you have to leave us one has to do with italy do you believe that the uh, recovery fund is going to be received uh, in italy within reasonable amount of time or is it going to come too late and the second question is how do you regard uh, the funds of the next uh, generation fund and how can we connect them to transparency given that we're also talking about companies in order to be able not to have tax oases and heavens for companies. So, is it feasible, therefore, uh, and to which extent uh, this is being taken care of? And then another question that has to do with taxation at corporate level, uh, that is, uh, can and maybe begin with a uh, limited number of member states uh, without having immediately all the member states uh, taking part and then we can have ads on later on. Well, as far as, uh, uh, for instance, the recovery fund is concerned, well, right now, uh, we have to take into consideration the next uh, generation fund as well. This has to be put to an end. Uh, because, indeed, and certainly, uh, as it happens, uh, with all uh, very, very new uh, documents and uh, actions, uh, I do fully understand the number of issues we're all confronted with. We should not ignore uh, the uh, hardships that you may find in some countries. Yet, I have to say that um, uh, this very courageous decision that was being taken by the European Commission must be approved by the Council. Now, if the Council, and I would leave off the if, the Council shall approve it, and I do believe it, before our summer pause, uh, and this fund, which is closely connected to the multi-year uh, funding of the Union, will indeed come into full-fledged force uh, since uh, starting and since January 1st, uh, 2021. Uh, the last contacts with the member states over the past um, few weeks were suggesting anyhow to start filing, discussing and defining these national plans which are then to be funded in particular by the uh, recovery and resiliency facility uh, already this coming autumn. Because if it is true that uh, then the uh, ability to truly finance it uh, is only going to come next year, but in my opinion, if the countries can file their own uh, parallel uh, proposals for budget laws in October and uh, the strategic plans for recovery financed uh, with European this will allow to indeed uh, make even more uh, 
so the fact that European resources have to be addressed to future plans, that is investments into digital transition, investments in terms of our Green Deal, uh, investments in terms of important reforms to correct uh, um, disruptive uh, situations in the various countries, and then you have the uh, standard budget where you may found uh, whereby you may found current expenses. So doing it in parallel, in my opinion, is truly important. Some of these instruments, particularly those that are indeed uh, addressing um, companies and organizations, may, in my opinion, be also coupled with incentives uh, to uh, good behaviors. For instance, one of these new instruments, uh, which is uh, a uh, indeed, uh, uh, you know, uh, a new acronym, uh, which is called uh, uh, Solvency Support Instrument, SSI, um, helping financially uh, organizations uh, in good health uh, and with a sound financial situation before the pandemic and which we regard as being strategic for Europe and are not being helped directly by their national uh, governments because maybe they have less chances from the taxation standpoint can be connected with some requirements. I have seen that, for instance, Vice President Stage has uh, mentioned this particular uh, possibility in some of uh, the statements that were being released and therefore some terms and conditions having to do with transparency, dividends, etc., etc., may be taken into due consideration. And eventually, again, there was a third question which unfortunately I can't remember. Would you be able to repeat it, please? Well, the third question was actually uh, the beginning uh, with uh, a uh, limited number of member states uh, because uh, that's going to take uh, too much time to get unanimity. You have already mentioned the uh, Article 116 of TFUA. How can we get to the majority? Yes. Uh, well, the artic Article 116 is something that needs to be assessed, needs to be evaluated very carefully, uh, but uh, what we need is um, uh, a, uh, to be very careful. Uh, there should be a gigantic distortion of the single market to um, have that happen, because this particular article has never been entered into force, because if we decide to resort to this article, well, that has to be a very clear-cut and very evident case. Now, when it comes to introducing a minimum corporate uh, tax, uh, uh, quite sincerely, I believe that we need much political work within the Commission by the member states. We need to work at the parliamentary level in order to get to take a unanimous decision because, unfortunately, a strengthened cooperation uh, in this particular case would be very useful. Otherwise, it would uh, run the risk of being a strengthened cooperation amongst uh, 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 virtuous countries, those uh, which have no uh, unlawful uh, competition and aggressive tax planning. If we have a strengthened cooperation among those countries which are already behaving positively and leaving out a number of countries which indeed, uh, on the contrary, uh, carry out uh, aggressive uh, policies of fiscal competition, we'll never get to the result and the outcome we want to reach. So what we need is a greater political awareness awareness by all member states, as well as uh, uh, a unanimous decision. And given that we have made a global bet, let's work for that. And if we are not going to reach it, let's work at least uh, towards this common uh, political awareness. Um, every now and then, I am favorable to strengthen cooperation, so, uh, but in this particular case, would not be the ideal situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We would like to wholeheartedly thank you, actually. And uh, we wish you at this point uh, to reach uh, 
the majority. We'd like to thank you for your report and uh, all the best uh, and thank you again. An online applause for Mr. Gentiloni. Thank you. Now we have uh, lots and lots of questions we uh, received, so we would like uh, to go through them with uh, Sven Giegold and Tito Boeri, and then we'll also leave the floor to you all. Some technical questions and also some numbers were required. So how much money are we going to, uh, do we lose uh, through money laundering? Sven Giegold, you talked about dividend arbitrage. Uh, what is it exactly? How does it work? And then uh, can you also explain to us a bit better uh, how the uh, tax police uh, uh, should work? Uh, what would be its tasks? And then a question about uh, the Brexit case. Sven Giegold, you talked about this before. What does that mean? What will this involve in the future? How are we going to manage the Brexit issue when it comes to companies and corporate tax rates? After Brexit, what will be the situation when it comes to competition? Taxes. And then uh, some questions for Tito Boeri. Uh, links uh, between money laundering and fiscal fraud. Uh, what are, uh, are the experiences uh, Italy has in this respect? And what kind of recommendations could be given to Germany by Mr. Boeri? Often uh, it is said that Italy represents a model. What is this model exactly? You know, what is it that works in Italy that could also work elsewhere in other countries? And then uh, also other technical questions such as how can we obtain uh, unanimity or is it would it be possible to avoid it and what would be the conditions and then another question was uh, to which extent uh, could uh, measures be introduced uh, to fight uh, tax fraud uh, and money laundering and then uh, corporate tax uh, um, during the 50s in Germany, but also in Japan, for example, uh, uh, actions were taken. So what could happen now? Sven, would you like to start? Well, obviously it's difficult uh, to answer all these uh, questions uh, together because obviously if, uh, if if you read specific books, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, dividend arbitrage means uh, exactly the following. Share for which you've paid a dividend tax or a tax on dividends is going to be uh, double credited because uh, basically tax authorities uh, do not cooperate uh, amongst themselves or between themselves uh, so you don't know exactly where the action takes place and this is a proper tax fraud that has to do with uh, the uh, dividends payout uh, there is only one action and uh, this action leads you to a tax uh, a double tax uh, recovery and this is a problem that doesn't involve germany alone uh, but rather many member states and despite this uh, no solution uh, no european common solution was found to dividend arbitrage recently uh, i made a request uh, in europe uh, and uh, europe tried uh, to tackle this issue in more detail they worked on it for about one and a half years but they didn't come to a solution but anyway, I think that the simplest solution would be to have one single registry, one single role, so that you can know exactly where you know the shares of a certain company are and where taxes for those uh, uh, shares have been paid and where dividends payout is taking place and where it should be credited. Unfortunately, we do not have this role, we don't have with this registry, and we don't have an effective and efficient flow of information. So what can the authorities do? Well, the idea, the basis of this proposal is that already today, 
you know, in the framework of the different treaties, we could assign Europol the mandate to start a trans-border um, surveys so that everything can happen at European level. And this doesn't happen yet. Europol currently doesn't coordinate uh, upon request uh, of uh, individual member states uh, and start uh, um, searching, uh, but uh, it cannot do so at a European level. And whilst crime is active at a European level, we're not coordinated when it comes uh, to possible investigations uh, carried out correctly at a European level. Only a few crimes uh, have been uh, highlighted as yet. Uh, so there should also be, uh, you know, a European public prosecutor uh, to do so, because otherwise uh, you endanger, you know, the interests of the economy itself. I mean, obviously there are uh, investigations being carried out that have to do with frauds when it comes to VAT. But as I said before, there is no European law to actually be able to carry out such investigations, even though, you know, in some cases this implies a huge outpace of money. And part of the players are international banks. And currently, we cannot uh, go against this uh, crime at a European level. Then another very interesting question uh, we received, i.e., yes, it is true, the UK has represented a sort of, uh, uh, you know, protector uh, or shield for uh, um, fiscal heavens. Uh, it's been uh, the most powerful country contrasting uh, uh, cooperation uh, uh, in Europe uh, uh, when it comes to taxes. Uh, uh, the UK left us and now this uh, allows us uh, to create uh, new rules and regulations and the following slogan should be true. If the UK does not set up uh, a clear regulation when it comes to competition, and this is true for the city in London, but also for the set of uh, uh, tax havens uh, connected to the EU, you can't have a cir uh, free circulation of capital uh, between the EU and uh, the UK. Uh, because otherwise, uh, you know, un unlawful competition would take place. Uh, there can be an exchange if there is a, a correct uh, fight against tax evasion uh, in tax havens. Francisca, at the beginning you talked about money laundering. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, jot down the question. Yes, the question had to do with uh, a common definition for money laundering. What do, you, what do we mean by this exactly? And what could, learn, what could uh, Germany learn from Italy? Well, Italy invested uh, huge resources uh, in fighting uh, mafia in Germany. We've always thought that mafia was uh, something uh, that existed only in Italy, but this is obviously not true because Germany is very much involved as well, uh, both when it comes to generalized crime and when it comes to mafia, uh, especially when uh, we talk about investment in real estate and or companies. Uh, we know, for example, that the Italian police uh, keeps uh, certain people uh, uh, under control and checks them on a regular basis. Uh, but unfortunately, in uh, Germany, this doesn't work very well. And also, uh, anti-money laundering activities are not particularly well developed. Uh, the Italian uh, police uh, and the Italian public prosecutors now have the necessary tools uh, to act. And uh, we also got from Italy another proposal, which unfortunately uh, was, became a law in Germany, but which is the uh, reversed uh, uh, burden of proof. Uh, if uh, the police finds, uh, say, money, and the person who has this money is a suspect and can't explain where the money comes from, well, then that person must demonstrate that that money does not come, come from criminal activities. In the past, uh, it was the state that had to prove, uh, who had, who had the, the, the burden of proof. Uh, and uh, to tell you a, a brief anecdote, uh, basically often we 
in the Bundestag worry about this, uh, but in my opinion, it is very important uh, to state that those who have lots of uh, real estate activities, uh, well, these people must uh, be able to explain exactly where uh, the money and the assets come from. Uh, the problem is that obviously we need to have a central framework uh, uh, managing all these different activities and these possible frauds and this uh, headquarters unfortunately uh, now does not exist or cannot really investigate on the cases being denounced and this obviously implies uh, risks in turn because in this manner you lose control of uh, criminal activities and this obviously hinders uh, European cooperation in this respect so the burden of proof and the reverse uh, burden of proof is of fundamental importance uh, also for safety reasons because in this manner we could actually stop such activities yes thank you very much mr tito boeri professor boeri uh, some questions to you now first of all the italian experiment uh, having to do with vat and uh, the exception that was uh, made for italy to be able to centralize the uh, the recording of data to avoid uh, crime and to avoid tax fraud. And then uh, um, maybe you can tell us something about uh, compensation when it comes uh, to corporate uh, income tax. How can we guarantee that the European funds will actually be spent in Italy for in, in, in view of a more sustainable economy? And then Marco Boato, Monica Frassoni and Cristina Simonini, as well as Gaetano Pazienza, have questions so they can get ready because we'll leave them the floor later on. Now I leave the floor to Mr. Tito Boeri, please. Well, thank you. Um, the, uh, thank you very much um, for the questions. I really would like to address a couple of issues that have been dealt with also within the previous discussion with Commissioner His Excellency Mr. Gentiloni. I got questions as well of people telling me, what about this uh, Hamiltonian moment uh, is made of few uh, historical memories that are uh, possibly not known to all of us. Mr. Hamilton was the Treasury Minister of the Federal Government of the US in 1790, and he was the one who was actually fighting uh, for the uh, mutualization and the splitting of the various debts in the various countries. Some resistance were being raised uh, by the wealthiest uh, states, such as Virginia. Uh, Virginia was totally against it uh, because uh, uh, there were other states Massachusetts in particular, who are making the most of it. So uh, the, the, this is what happened in Europe not until long ago. And uh, then eventually this uh, became a true uh, change of uh, pace uh, in terms of political and economic integration, but in particular political integration in the US, which then led to one of the big turning points in the US. And we are discussing right now whether the, what is happening right now in Europe can be compared to this. I believe that one of the common themes about this particular episode uh, is uh, if we have uh, a tax ability within the framework of the European Commission, and this is fundamental because whenever uh, the uh, Commission or the European budget has to finance some European programs, and there are lots and lots of uh, projects that have to be, um, you know, uh, dealt with, uh, starting with the environment, etc., we need to negotiate on a state-by-state -state basis. And so if we have no interest Operability, the Commission will run the risk of not being able to plan out all the actions uh, since the deadline is just far too long. And so it's fundamental, for instance, to uplift uh, from the European Central Bank because they've been uh, charged uh, with uh, actions over the past few years which were not actually up to them to perform. As Mr. Gentiloni was pointing out, all these are, you know, issue, uh, issuing of debts uh, with very long debt 
deadlines and maturities, etc., to finance all this and to fund all these uh, projects. And to us to do so, the Commission has to prove uh, that uh, uh, it has its own tax uh, um, saying. Uh, of course, Italy has to do in terms of uh, fighting against uh, uh, tax uh, evasion as well as fraud. Uh, and these are two serious issues within Italy. And let's say that the most important results uh, that have been achieved uh, were being achieved uh, when it was possible to take into consideration all the pieces of information also, which are part of the various public administrations. And I'm saying that also on behalf of those who have, uh, for instance, managed uh, the exchange change of data between our uh, welfare system and the uh, tax authorities was fundamental in order to try to recover fraudulent uh, behaviors and uh, retrieve money which was not being uh, paid for and was being due uh, because some of the organizations uh, were claiming that they could benefit from some uh, um, you know benefits which were not so and when we were double checking all this information with the information coming from the tax authorities, we were able to recover important amounts of money. On the other hand, we have uh, many policies, uh, money transfers as well as uh, project transfer, um, depend upon a number of different considerations also at the level of banks. And so uh, through stricter controls, uh, we were able to indeed, uh, um, watch better on the situation. And putting all these data banks together, we can also uh, be better off in terms of identifying uh, abnormal behaviors. For instance, you claim you have a certain level of threshold of expenses or you carry out something which is doubtful eventually, you can actually intensify checks and controls. Uh, fight against uh, uh, tax fraud and tax evasion uh, is being carried out uh, through a dialogue uh, with the data bank. There is no need of setting up a single data bank which can be frightening for some, but just having all the various data banks in public administration and, and authorities to be able to talk to each other, and this has to be so at European level as well, because my own personal experience when it comes to Italian public administration is that whenever anybody left Italy, we would completely lose track of these people and or organizations, and this of course allows you to have fraudulent forms and fraudulent behaviors. Maybe, uh, you know, someone who's registered uh, on the dole of some country and then they receive this money because they're unemployed and they're not and therefore uh, we urge for a stronger European cooperation on this level as well. What about the greater attention by Italy when it comes to environmental issues? Well, I believe that there, of course, uh, is a greater level of awareness right now and this has increased as well over the recent period of lockdown. Well, I believe, I must say, that therefore we can lay down the foundations to be able to be more assertive at this level. Although in Italy, although we're not uh, having such a marked political representation as much as you have and find in other countries. And this allows me to just briefly mention another issue uh, when it comes to tax resources. Uh, tax capacity at European level is an issue and people say uh, you know, resources being gathered by the Commission um, have to do with carbon tax, plastic tax, etc., etc. Well, I believe that we've got to be very careful. Certainly, these are fundamental taxes. They're fundamental in order to improve and enhance our environment and create a deterrent in terms of these emissions, but the very aim of these taxes is not to gather money, but to actually discard uh, fraudulent uh, behaviors. And therefore, uh, uh, we would like in the first place no one to damage uh, the environment. If we want to create a fiscal credit at European level, we have to turn our attention to something else. And these are all issues that are being part of our own appeal. And last but not least, unanimity is a fundamental, it's a key issue. It was very important what Commissioner Gentiloni was saying, uh, strength and cooperation would all, only go to the benefit to these countries which are actually holding back on cooperation at this level. Unanimity may be urged because there is a strong damage to competition that is 
is being caused. That is, in other words, this reduction of the labor rate on income is due to the behavior of some large companies, which in one way or another are fighting against uh, being able to have a healthy competition. This phenomenon of market concentration, which is very strong, and you see it in the national level. And I believe that the European Commission is eligible to urge for this principle to be introduced uh, so that uh, uh, the majority-based set of decisions can be taken. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question from uh, Mrs. Spielhagen for Mr. Paolo Gentiloni, who's no longer with us. Uh, the EU or the European Commission in uh, 2020 and 2021 uh, will come up uh, with uh, proposals on this. Uh, so we hope uh, there will be very courageous uh, proposals. You didn't answer Brigitte Jan's question. You'll do it later. We have Christina instead uh, who would like uh, to ask uh, a question, please. The mic is uh, off at the moment, so you should just turn it on to ask your question. Otherwise, uh, Marco Boato, would you like to ask your question? You can switch the mic on and ask the question, please, to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a very simple question, which was for Mr. Gentiloni. I thought he could stay for two hours, but uh, I ask the same question to Sven and Tito. You have uh, talked about the five fundamental points of the appeal I also signed. I repeat once again, I would have asked uh, this question to Mr. Gentiloni, but I ask you to make a forecast. Uh, what real possibilities uh, do we have that those uh, five points uh, either fully and or partly are going to be uh, taken up uh, by the European institutions and or by the European Commission? And how long uh, will it take uh, for them uh, to accept these five points? Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. So, Sven, to you, is it realistic? Is it credible? And uh, why is it that there is no not one single role, one single registry for shares? Because, I mean, obviously we hope for these uh, proposals uh, to, to develop further. Well, first of all, as far as Brigitte Jan's question, I'm sorry I didn't answer your question. I hope uh, I hoped uh, Tito Boeri would do so because uh, maybe this was a question for him because it has to do with uh, uh, income. But basically, we have always tried to impose a higher uh, taxation on capital. After the latest uh, European crisis, we insisted on uh, including a, a tax uh, on this, uh, connected to a very clear target, uh, which uh, can be defined uh, within the uh, German parliament that makes everything a bit more realistic within Germany, but also uh, outside of Germany. Mr. Mr. Gentiloni talked about this, uh, uh, you know, differences amongst uh, the population have increased uh, due to the pandemic uh, for different reasons uh, and this means that those uh, couldn't work uh, uh, with remote working uh, maybe lost their jobs uh, or just uh, received a very limited uh, amount of money from uh, the state uh, and so these people were stuck much harder than uh, people kept on working uh, and have a more stable income. As a consequence, uh, we have, uh, you know, an unbalanced uh, uh, spreading of uh, capital. In Germany, this is even uh, worse. Now, in uh, the German parliament, there is no majority in this respect. And also in the Bundesrat, uh, there is no majority when it comes to welfare, um, which is so unequal. Uh, uh, as for a tax uh, on... Uh, corporate taxes, 
uh, as a co corporate tax uh, I, on corporate assets, uh, I think uh, we should try and reach unanimity amongst all member states. And uh, I mean, this is obviously our target, uh, even though it is uh, still not uh, a target uh, for politicians. I am amongst those who believe that this type of tax should be structured in a smart manner uh, by making it uh, uh, something favorable for investments without creating any further burden to companies. But it's important to say that given that there is so much private uh, assets, uh, uh, well, that could not be taxed uh, because otherwise, you know, uh, you know, the, the, we would at that point uh, have too many taxes for, uh, you know, the German bourgeoisie. I mean, this is a, a, a target we want to achieve, but certainly not a target we're going to achieve very quickly. Then uh, there was Marco's question. Uh, real possibilities of achieving the five points. Uh, well, basically, many of the elements we are talking about uh, are already in the political pipeline. I mean, we did not uh, uh, include in this appeal unrealistic requests. Uh, uh, these are requests that are already part of uh, the European Commission's discussion. Today, the commissioner said something very clear. He talked about Article 116. Uh, uh, which means that basically we want uh, majority decisions uh, when it comes to taxation. And this is extremely important. Uh, the aspect that I'm not certain about, certain about yet uh, is how much it is going to be spent uh, to reach this target. Uh, I heard what Ursula von der Leyen said uh, about uh, the fiscal issue in Europe. Uh, as to Moscovici uh, and Juncker said, uh, there is still a big uh, difference. Juncker and uh, Moscovici um, have made it one of the fundamental aspects, uh, and they both uh, stated that they want to see progress on this. Uh, but uh, I did not uh, hear anybody else uh, seriously talk about this. Uh, so if we really want to um, do something serious uh, today and during the last five years we've made huge progress uh, in Europe compared to the previous 25 years when it comes to taxation. Well, this uh, means that our ambitions, both the European Commission's uh, uh, ambitions and the member states' ambitions uh, uh, are closer now and uh, we need uh, to raise the bar and also we need uh, to insist so that resistance such as uh, coming from countries such as the Netherlands uh, who want to keep their safe heavens uh, uh, be you know overcome we still have monica frassoni who uh, was uh, the president of the european green so i'll leave her the floor is the mic on Monica, to you. Mi sentite? Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Ok, grazie. Eh, prima di tutto volevo farvi no, veramente first, i miei enormi complimenti per questa iniziativa che mi sembra veramente bellissima. E potrei, vorrei approfittare della presenza del professor Coeli per chiedergli questo. To ask um, to uno dei più Coeli. grandi problemi del nostro paese è quello della capacità, l'ha detto anche lei, di spesa uh, eh, rispetto uh, uh, a, non soltanto alle, agli aiuti europei che già ci sono, quindi fondi strutturali, ma anche tutto quello che ha a che vedere con la capacità amministrativa proprio di gestirli uh, uh, e io vorrei, uh, lei ne ha parlato brevemente uh, vorrei che lei ha un pochino più a fondo rispetto a questo cioè like quali to, uh, sono uh, well secondo lei le cose, in le mostre opinion, che devono essere fatte e magari anche le condizioni che devono essere messe a livello europeo che io penso che ci debba essere una condizionalità magari una condizionalità verde ma ci deve essere una condizionalità della concessione dei fondi soprattutto per la passata di finanza comunitaria Especially if they have to go through the community, European community budget. What are the moves that need to be made uh, by our bureaucracy? So that these work. And then, if you allow me, Francisca, I also want to say that quite often these uh, problems are not just administrative problems. They are political problems. If we look at what is being discussed for the relaunch, for the relaunch decree now, to relaunch the relaunch of our economy, 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 the relaunch
noi vediamo che alcune, alcune questioni verdi sono molto Some green issues are very important. We are talking about you know, the possibility of eliminating diesel cars or we are trying to insist on energy efficiency of positive devices to go a step forward in terms of energy class. So I'd like Mr. Boeri to uh, briefly dwell on this a bit longer. Well, thank you very much, Monica, and uh, uh, just uh, um, we're very happy to have you with us today. There's another question um, by Giuseppe, Professor Boeri. Let's wait for his question. Giuseppe, please uh, switch on your mic. Uh, your microphone is on. You can just, uh, you just have to switch it on. Giuseppe? Uh, Giuseppe, uh, Giuseppe, please. Uh, well, we give the floor to Mr. Boeri. We give the floor to Mr. Boeri right now. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to go back uh, to uh, the European uh, tax on assets and income. And Sven has already given a, an answer. Uh, we always have to agree upon what assets and welfare means and wealth means. Uh, because in Italy, for instance, part of the private wealth is being held uh, in terms of real estates, simply homes. Uh, so the reason why one has to take into consideration a European tax uh, um, is because it allows us to avoid uh, uh, income to move from one country to the next in order to simply avoid uh, this tax. So uh, you uh, cause a competition uh, amongst various countries in order to attract uh, this part of wealth which is very mobile. Now, now we have to get uh, coordinated in order to avoid this to happen. When the wealth uh, is in terms of real estate, uh, well, uh, the very definition of real estate does not give you the chance of moving the assets from one country to another. So personally, I think that it's fair enough to actually have a tax on uh, wealth, especially because uh, we're getting out of this crisis with a very high public in debt. And, uh, therefore, you know, I believe that an initiative uh, in this specific um, sector, when it comes, for instance, to uh, real estate, uh, may uh, stay in each single country. There is no need for having a European approach where situations are different, requirements are different, and needs are different. Now, also when it comes to the, the way to approach all this, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, the question is very much timed and to the point. Uh, the government in Italy has the ability of spending the funds being received uh, within the framework of uh, this plan. And we're talking about rather considerable amounts of money. Uh, so we are going to be able to spend the funds of the recovery fund, especially the European Commission has to set conditions. And I wouldn't really be very happy to um, talk about conditionality, because conditionality calls for situations that are rather different. When it comes to conditionality, you always think about the Troika and the um, austerity programs imposed, uh, that is, those experiences uh, that were being uh, gone through during the uh, crisis of Greece, etc., or the crisis of the Eurozone. These are forms of solidarity and help, because we fully aware, as we write in our appeal as well, and drafted in our appeal, uh, this crisis is not due to the opportunistic behavior of some countries, but it is a pandemic that has uh, actually hit all countries, some more, some less, but we have to give a common answer to this. And this was the spirit for this uh, leap forward in terms of policy at European level. Having said so, I totally agree on the fact that the European Commission must be very careful because uh, the amount of money are definitely large and also um, uh, there are also one-shot aids uh, which are rather consistent and of course in compliance with uh, priorities set forth by the national governments 
the uh, EU has to double check on the fact that the money that goes for some specific uh, purposes is being actually spent on those specific purposes because more often than not, uh, the impact uh, then becomes different uh, than uh, what was being stated in the legislator's intention. So the help by Europe is really very important indeed also in terms of targeting um, that is really being able to reach out to people, to uh, organizations or territories that you want to reach through those policies. Therefore, welcome to this European aid uh, without conditionality uh, in order to comply with the priorities set forth by each single member state. Of course, I'm also worried in terms of the uh, ability that our country, Italy, has to manage it all. Uh, there is a progress in terms of being able to manage the transfers, although much remains, very much remains to be done, also based upon the recent experiences that we went through when we were actually launching a few emergency plans. But the delays uh, have to do more than anything else with investment uh, plans, and we have to delegate uh, through uh, uh, in competition rules and we have to carry out checks in order to avoid uh, widespread uh, crime to take on. Um, the danger in Italy is a, an excessive fragmentation of the uh, um, centers where uh, uh, tenders are being uh, indeed uh, filed and launched. We have uh, too many organizations, too many authorities when it comes to tendering and this is a mistake because these are complex endeavors and require skills and a great deal of attention under this respect and therefore i believe that uh, what we have to try to do is to uh, accept these mechanisms to the possible extent at least at provincial level so that we may speed up uh, in terms of being able to make public investments and at the same time carry out checks. Because what often happens is that people say bureaucracy slows everything down and then you just get rid of all controls. Well, this is not really the ideal situation for our country. Indeed, we have to follow the rules, as I suggested, that is, for instance, be able to have tendering uh, and uh, 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 calls for tenders as they should be done according to legislation. Uh, yes, uh, we have a set of uh, other questions uh, for Mr. Boeri. So we are talking about uh, the level of tenders, uh, and this is extremely interesting because it obviously has to do with all systems uh, and uh, uh, led to controversies also here in Germany. And then, uh, uh, you know, the uh, environmental conditionality is when uh, we commit ourselves uh, so that this is uh, something uh, written back on white, I mean, talking about the Green Deal, but we're also fighting uh, for this uh, so that we can finance the economy for the future. Okay, so you can switch on your mic if you want, you can take the floor, and then I'll leave the floor to Pietro. And then I'll collect a few more uh, of the written questions. Giuseppe, can you, is Giuseppe there? Otherwise we can leave the floor to Pietro, please. Pietro, just switch your mic on and you can uh, take the floor. No, Pietro is no longer there. He asked uh, uh, to take the floor, but then I'll read out uh, the set of questions we received uh, on our Q&A. Isn't fiscal fraud connected to the fact that tax uh, uh, legislation is too complex? Uh, shouldn't we need uh, a simplification? Because at this point, obviously, our lives uh, would become much easier, also in terms of less fiscal fraud. Then Brexit. Uh, won't uh, the UK used uh, to avoid uh, taxation? How can we act uh, preventively? Uh, how can we avoid for companies uh, to uh, move their headquarters there? Then another question that has to do with the account large accounting uh, firms uh, such as Ernst Young. Um, they ask uh, um, 
and say that these companies also provide consultancy when it comes to uh, fiscal dumping and tax fraud. So how can we make these companies more uh, reliable? Wouldn't it be necessary to have a breaking up of these companies? Or wouldn't it be necessary to have new legislations and all regulations for these companies uh, and uh, uh, further checks? And then another question, which has just been translated, and which I will briefly read out from my smartphone. Um, now, as for Brexit, When it comes to Brexit, uh, will it be necessary to translate uh, into uh, other languages because everybody then uh, must be capable of understanding uh, tax language? Uh, and then a question about uh, the minimum uh, income tax. Uh, the proposal was 0.5%, uh, and uh, this is a 0.5% everybody would have to pay at European level. Uh, I mean, it's a very specific question. I guess uh, the question uh, had to do, the, 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 lang uh, the, the question having to do with language uh, is important. I mean, how can we guarantee majority and how can we allow everybody to participate? Sven, would you like to start? Or maybe Mr. Tito Boeri, who of you would like to start answering? Sven, please. Sure. I'll try and be, and be as brief as possible. Now, first of all, tax simplification, tax streamlining. Uh, I took up this commitment in the past. Uh, I developed uh, a project uh, for a very simple tax. I'm very much in favor of tax simplification, of course, uh, but you can never simplify everything uh, to the extent that you know then everybody uh, complies uh, to avoid uh, crime with a zero percent uh, tax obviously we cannot compete uh, this is what the data highlights now the reason why we have uh, crime is not uh, because uh, taxation is complex uh, obviously complexity is a disadvantage because it has a repercussion on SMEs on smaller but there are very many reasons why we should try and simplify, uh, you know, tax law. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about the German tax laws. Uh, but we will never be able to avoid crime uh, through this. Uh, uh, to fight crime, we need very stringent, very severe uh, rules and international cooperation. So those who take up the risk of hiding the money in a fiscal heaven, don't worry about fiscal complexity. Uh, in fact, uh, we often forget that companies, uh, that for companies, uh, you know, the biggest uh, tax heaven is the Netherlands uh, in Europe. Uh, the Netherlands, together with Luxembourg and other um, countries uh, such as Malta, represent a huge problem when it comes to tax evasion and uh, obviously Brexit should not worry as much in this respect. Uh, Ireland has created a, a unique system to uh, actually ease up uh, taxation for companies and this is something other member states have done and this is the point i mean if we define a minimum taxation uh, for everybody in europe uh, uh, we would solve this problem but obviously uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without political clashes uh, because those countries which adopted a certain business model i mean if we now offer them the possibility of uh, adopting uh, during a transition period uh, a different type of policy because we know obviously that competition in europe is something that has been existing for decades uh, and many thought it positive with very few exceptions uh, so the possibility of checking the accounts uh, becomes extremely important uh, because uh, obviously auditing uh, allows us to check uh, the, the financial statements of all different companies uh, and uh, auditing companies uh, 
are uh, oligopolies uh, uh, because they audit uh, the major uh, companies and what do they do? Well, basically, they carry out auditing activities, but they also provide consultancy work. And we believe that these two tasks should be separate, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, they should be separate for the company because if you're auditing a company, you cannot at the same time provide consultancy to that same company. And uh, we have noticed uh, in very many cases that there are huge uh, quality issues uh, when this happens uh, because uh, auditors uh, are not uh, that strict uh, when they also provide consultancy work. Uh, um, and why so? But obviously, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, what they're auditing is uh, the company which then provides them money so that they can give consultancy activities. Uh, so, I mean, we're not just talking about... Uh, I mean, we're also talking about conflict of interest uh, uh, among uh, between these two different activities. Uh, but uh, I'm also talking about the conflict of interest that lies in the fact that those uh, who ask uh, for auditing in the end uh, are going to be uh, audited in terms uh, and then uh, uh, a tax uh, on European income. Well, uh, whether each of us has to pay 0.5% or, or any other rate uh, uh, is not that important. In my opinion, what is really important uh, would be to have a European tax because uh, it, uh, Europe needs a, a tax authority so as to allow for common investments within Europe and so that these uh, common investments do not simply depend on the capability of each individual member state to contribute. So setting a European tax, maybe say a tax on financial transactions, a tax on the for the environment would allow Europe to, to provide funds in a in a more consistent manner well yes to you mr tito boeri and then uh, we will move on to the other questions thank you very much yes i'll also try and uh, answer questions that were asked uh, before i will simply say that the complexity of tax regimes which is very high in the case of my country it is very very complicated uh, to file taxes, uh, cannot justify crime, cannot justify tax evasion, uh, and uh, it cannot even explain tax evasion and all frauds in general. Well, maybe tax complexity, I mean, the complexity of the fiscal regime often makes, uh, you know, fighting evasion even more complicated because it requires the cooperation of different public administrations. Uh, I was talking about fake compensations before. Well, in that case, you can also act with a very complex tax regime if you have cooperation amongst the different administrations. I think that the basic problem, going back to what I was saying before, is that in Italy, for example, when it comes to the capacity to disbursement, is to strengthen the cooperation amongst the different public administrations. People working for the public administration must be aware of the fact that they're part of a one single machine. There shouldn't be division separations or jealousies uh, amongst different public administrations. This is true for central public administration and the relationship between public central public administration and decentralized public administration offices. The way in which you assess uh, what uh, the managers of a public administration do uh, must uh, follow this principle. Cooperation is a, a sine qua non condition. You have to feel part of the whole. And this is not what happens today. You know, you are successful if you're defending your own little uh, field, you know, uh, and uh, it's not important to be part uh, of, a, of a global, of a more sort of uh, national uh, public administration. So we don't need to simplify taxes to fight uh, uh, evasion, uh, to fight tax evasion. 
But obviously, it is important to simplify taxes uh, so as to allow citizens to accept uh, taxes as something which is a bit more transparent so that they know exactly what they're paying for. It's important to streamline because many citizens who didn't pay in the past, you know, who evaded uh, taxes in the past, and so, you know, now public money being used uh, for doctors and nurses working against the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, are reviewing their position now. So if we were good enough in streamlining the tax system, uh, probably also uh, in this case we could contrast uh, tax evasion uh, better. And then another remark as to the issue of uh, uh, the European taxation uh, uh, on income uh, uh, and income tax. I don't think uh, we can fund uh, long term uh, uh, instruments such as the recovery fund uh, with money coming from individual member states. I mean, uh, it, would, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't be functional. It would uh, always put the European Commission in a position of great fragility in taking the initiative because obviously these are long-term um, decisions. I mean, the fight to improve, uh, you know, the quality of the environment is not something we have to rediscuss every year with, uh, you know, uh, never-ending discussions amongst uh, the different member states. Also, because obviously all these members, all the member states uh, are now exiting this crisis with a uh, huge GDP uh, um, debts. So let's put ourselves on the citizen side. Citizens often have different levels of taxations. They have local taxes, uh, municipal taxes, provincial taxes, regional taxes, and then they have the national taxes as well. Do we want to add another level of taxation at European level? Well, I don't think uh, this is something that is going to be accepted uh, by you know, individual citizens uh, in a very positive manner. I mean, there is a lot of skepticism as for Europe and European initiatives, and this would create even more suspicion. Uh, the idea is that of uh, widening uh, the, the, the mass of money, because uh, Europe uh, can tax income in a regular manner everywhere and this is the basic idea which is also behind our appeal and it's a fundamental principle so we need to act on those uh, income which is being moved from one country to the next we must uh, not allow companies uh, uh, setting up their headquarters in different countries so that they can pay much less taxes than elsewhere. We must uh, obviously define taxation on the basis of consumers using those assets, etc., etc. That's the type of principles which we need to adopt. And only through European coordination can we do so and tax uh, these uh, types of incomes. Uh, this is a fundamental European initiative which should not be added to all the other taxes. We should not create further board burdens because, you know, there are certain, some citizens who are already uh, very much burdened by taxations. But with this, uh, we would have the possibility of stopping those who are, who are evading taxes or are moving their companies elsewhere to avoid paying taxes in their own country. So this is the way we can contrast this type of tax evasion, I think. Yeah, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, once again, Mr. Boeri, now uh, the last uh, round of questions, they're extremely timely. Sven, maybe you can tell us how we, the Greens, truly uh, think in terms of uh, a next generation fund connected with uh, ecological considerations, uh, because uh, we would like to know a legal frame uh, within this particular fund. And then another question to you in terms of income tax. You talked about real estate, and this makes things even more complex. But how can we, in one way or another fight against all these uh, speculations and how can we uh, rule out a better taxation set of rules uh, and then another thing that has been adopted and then further developed in the next six months to come we have heard Commissioner Gentiloni earlier on saying that if it is not going to be possible to have unanimity there will be a European proposal being filed to which extent is this possible and again another question uh, which in one way or another uh, has to do with uh, an issue which you have already mentioned, that is, uh, what's going to happen should we 
uh, go for a full-fledged transparency by all organizations uh, in terms of financial transactions. Uh, how can we rule out uh, such transparency so that uh, whatever deed uh, not being transparent uh, is being turned into a criminal act. Where do we need still transparency or have we adopted all measures needed to guarantee transparency? And then another question, uh, um, which is rather more of a statement and you can read. And there is another question having to do uh, with the improvement of lack of efficiency uh, and excess of red tape and bureaucracy, which uh, has not only got to do with Italy, uh, but uh, I address this question to Mr. Boeri. Uh, what can Europe do in terms of uh, clearing some bureaucracy and red tape? And maybe Ben can also answer to this. And eventually a comment that has to do with uh, Article 14 of the um, indeed uh, uh, German law, uh, that is, uh, how can we enforce uh, what Article 14 sets forth? Sven, to you the floor. Professor Boeri, would you like to take the floor? Well, among other, well, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to you all for the really uh, high quality standard of all the questions. Uh, uh, we are tackling very complex but rather very relevant themes. First of all, um, real estate taxation. Well, in principle, real estate uh, is easier uh, to be taxed on um, because by definition it's not possible to move a piece of real estate from one country to another. Um, but these are also assets uh, which are definitely being rooted and therefore it's very difficult. We run the risk of actually uh, causing a problem of uh, um, liquidity to people because if you are being taxed based upon your own real estate, um, one cannot sell them off completely or, you know, one uh, has to sell them uh, 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 being underrated and uh, this is anyhow based on current level of income and uh, this puts families into hardships and there are many cases in Italy elderly people who are house rich and cash poor, so to say. So they have little cash, but uh, maybe a good real estate set of assets. So one has to be very careful in terms of planning out uh, legal instruments when it comes to this. So you need to pay a great deal of attention. When it comes to excess red tape and bureaucracy, I fully agree with it. We have to actually try to be fair because bureaucracy means everything and nothing at the same time. In my opinion, one of the most most important problems when it comes to a smooth operation of governmental action. The, well, this is not just connected to bureaucracy, but to the intertwining between administrations and legislation. That is, there is a phase in between from when a bill becomes law and then is being enforced. In this particular stage, there are many factors. Uh, not allowing the law to be enforced according to legislators' intention. And the uh, hardest thing is people. There is a class between politicians and administration, uh, between bureaucracy and political representation, and often this is a, uh, a faction uh, that is deteriorating things because they act upon political mandate, but they do not uh, indeed uh, a highlight on the ethnical aspects and they do not warn a politician uh, or a legislator uh, by saying, well, listen, this is actually not true, not fair. You don't know the machine. You don't know the situation. You're not actually taking into consideration a number of issues. And we have to do something on this. Every single time a bill is being passed on to law, we should sit around the table, politicians as well as legislators, there is no need for delegating any, this to anybody because a politician has to know how things are being enforced, members of the administration, some of the parties, the so-called stakeholders, 
stakeholders. They should all sit around the table. Policy has already been decided upon, and we're not really discussing in terms of political decision because this is only up to politicians. But how to avoid a certain policy to be enforced at a longer deadline or in one way or another is being uh, getting out of track, and therefore this needs to be indeed taken into serious consideration. Bureaucracy is needed on these mechanisms. Europe can help us a lot because Europe is different, because Europe is so uh, such a wide mix. Uh, we have some administrations that work perfectly well, some others um, which don't. So we have pros and cons, we have uh, positive and negative experiences we can draw upon and we should cooperate more on this ground as well. Thank you very much. Uh, now we give the floor to um, uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, we, uh, when you say that we probably don't need further European taxes, well, I believe that at a European level we would need that because if uh, at national level we are not in a position of managing things uh, smoothly enough, in our opinion, there are specific situations where in order to be truly able to keep uh, a uh, correct and smooth uh, income flow, we would need a European tax as then. We're talking about the levels here. And uh, uh, the European initiative is a way, indeed, of getting in income. That's what I was saying. But we should not get to a fourth or fifth level of uh, uh, taxation to those who are already paying for taxes. And uh, yes, we have to uh, create value added, otherwise it would be completely meaningless. Sven, now to you the floor. Uh, you've been asked lots of questions and then we shall close our webinar. Well, thank you very much of giving answers to this last round of questions. Well, first of all, as far as uh, the uh, minimum uh, income uh, tax or corporate tax, uh, um, the um, uh, proposals filed by uh, lately by the Commission was uh, the creation of a digital tax involving uh, sales of large digital corporations, startups and small to medium sized companies would be uh, cut off and uh, the income would be equal to 5 billion euros and then the German government came along, they feared criticisms from the US because of course uh, there were a few US companies involved uh, actively in Europe uh, but paying no taxes at all on their profits being made here. Now we missed another couple of years we uh, gave them some 10 billion euros for free as a gift uh, which we could have used uh, for uh, lots of things here in Europe. Now the debate is back on and the deadline is the end of this year but it's very difficult to get to an agreement really uh, this comes as a surprise uh, if we never begin in europe certainly at global level we'll never be able to get to an agreement and in the us um, they have tried to streamline taxes trump actually started a large uh, reform in terms of corporate taxation and uh, of course uh, is never wondered uh, why uh, or shall i do it or don't do it uh, according to what the europeans are going to be thinking about it we have to raise our level of awareness here in europe we have to raise our voices and say here there is a, a tax unbalance and we have to find the solution at the same time we have to find a uh, global balance or an international balance at a global level of course uh, it would be better to impose a global tax. But if we never begin, we'll never get anywhere, either at the end of this year, we're not gonna know whether we're gonna be doing it next year. And if we talk about sovereignty at European level, we have to be courageous enough to impose the digital tax because these uh, flows of money should never go away from Europe because if they wanna work here and they have sales here, we have to have a, a tax here in Europe as Mr. Tito Boyer is likely pointed 
out. And we have to implement and enforce the reasonable tax. I get angry every single time I think about it because the initiative came from Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, United Kingdom, uh, Poland, etc. All wanted more than Germany and Germany imposed itself and really succeeded in postponing the entire question in Europe. I could get even more angry now, but I shall spare you from this because of time constraints. As far as transparency is concerned, um, there are more radical proposals such as those from Sweden and Finland. From a, a, You go to a tax authority and say, well, listen, give me what my next neighbor uh, paid in terms of income tax, what about his company, etc., etc., and we can double check on that. We have already talked about H3, that is our uh, working team. Uh, I wouldn't want to, you know, uh, be able to see every single neighbor going investigating on what the next door neighbor does, etc. Also, because this entails risks. If we take the Scandinavian countries, the situation is easier, but we are pro this. Uh, large companies should make public in on a country by country basis uh, their sales and uh, the taxes that they pay for because these are exactly the same pieces of information that SMEs actually must file and make public for instance if I ask uh, what an SME did and how much they paid either in Italy or in Germany, I can know that when it comes to large companies, I can't. They only give you global figures. Uh, data must be available because they have to be passed on to tax authorities and we want them to be made public and therefore in our appeal we're actually asking for everyone to make uh, their data public. But of course we wouldn't want, of course, to uh, this to involve all pieces of data. Uh, when it comes to the terms and conditions connected to weather change, well, and um, fight against uh, weather change, uh, in principle, we follow the uh, rule that we need to strengthen uh, budgets uh, for uh, fighting against climate change, whilst for all other details, uh, we want uh, uh, the do not harm principle to prevail. For instance, when it comes to the recovery fund, this recovery fund should not really strengthen uh, the uh, negative impact from the, way, uh, the climate change. And this is our um, orientation, and this has to be taken into consideration for these fresh funds for recovery purposes, not for the old plans, of course, we may be able to continue to finance actions which indeed uh, do nothing but, uh, you know, making even more severe the problems connected to uh, climate change. What we want is that, in principle, investments uh, to the detriment of, and therefore worsening, uh, the situation of climate change not be uh, funded through the European Union, but at present we have a uh, sound fund uh, for recovery post uh, coronavirus uh, without getting you to the details, etc. When it comes to the policy of climate change, we have to have more specific goals by 2030. And I'm saying it uh, and I raise it. Uh, before the presidency of the German Council. The fight of, against uh, climate change is uh, actually smoothed uh, over and over again. And also, uh, within the Commission, this is not as strong as it used to be before. So it's completely meaningless if the, uh, you know, requirements when it comes to um, reform, uh, uh, the ecological tax, etc., uh, and all the laws against, uh, fighting uh, climate change are being reduced. And this should not happen both in terms of council and the uh, commission as well. During our presidency of the council, we have to decide the new budget for the European Union vis-a-vis -vis Brexit, but at the same level we have to put the Green Deal and the uh, fight against climate change. We and Brussels uh, uh, still have a lot to do. Thank you very much, Sven. We want that the presidency of the council 
uh, from Germany will de devote itself to fighting against climate change and we are concentrated upon fighting against climate change, circular economy, and therefore all these details and aspects uh, which should never be neglected in terms of our recovery and relaunching post-coronavirus. I think this is one of the main tasks. So it's important for funds to be made available, but it is also important to have the legal framework to do so. And to this extent, uh, obviously, we will act uh, with uh, uh, the presidents of the Council in Germany. Today, we talked uh, uh, about uh, this appeal. We saw that these uh, measures uh, are shared by all. Nobody went uh, against them. Uh, I mean, there is no contrast. There is no public resistance. Uh, so I believe uh, it is uh, a task for all of us uh, to exercise uh, further pressure. Uh, civil society and everybody will have to uh, exercise pressure to reach such targets. Uh, so here again, uh, you have uh, the link in the chat. Uh, please share it with your friends, uh, share it on the social media. Keep on, uh, you know, signing this appeal because uh, we have the possibility of making progress in this respect. It's a question of uh, having the possibility to intervene. Uh, it's the possibility to guarantee quality uh, through generations. We can't keep wasting uh, billion uh, uh, to, to, to crime, uh, which obviously is something that subtracts money to different member states. This is no longer acceptable. So public opinion must exercise pressure to avoid this altogether. I'd like to thank all the participants. I'd like to thank you all for your questions and your comments. Uh, I think we answered uh, almost all questions uh, and you can still send uh, questions to me, to uh, Sven Giggold and to Mr. Tito Boeri. We will also answer you through email and please do also send uh, new ideas and new proposals for uh, the future webinars. Uh, if you are interested in something in particular, please communicate this to us. We will be glad to, to, to try and consider your suggestions. Thank you very much, Mr. Broveri, for the time. Uh, thank you, Ben, for your work. Thanks uh, both uh, for having signed uh, the appeal. We keep on fighting for a more balanced uh, uh, Europe, and we try and make steps forwards on a daily basis. I'd like to thank you very much, uh, and uh, have a good evening. Um,